Good morning, everyone. Number, I'm on number two, just in case that didn't come through. Well, I'm glad to be here with you this morning. Again, uh, I want to remind you, uh, if you would, uh, open up your Facebook apps, either right now or when you get home, and uh, remember to like and share our video so that we can have the, the widest possible reach into our world and community. And uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about Uh, an issue that I I think is on uh, many people's minds. Uh, It's been on my mind the past number of weeks. And uh, it's the reality that God makes the broken whole. Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. I apologize. The Romans, I was going to go to Romans to do this, but I I think Psalm 2 here for us this morning Psalm 2, beginning in verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings set the earth, or the kings of the earth, excuse me, set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Skipping now down to verse 10. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, or perhaps also to be rendered, worship the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all. Who take refuge in Him. The beginning portions of the psalm make me think about our present day. Why do the nations rage? Of course, I'm not speaking necessarily of nations, but maybe our own nation, our own peoples, our own world, our own time, and our own place. There's a lot of rage and anger, violence and hatred. There's a lot of talking without listening. It seems that the psalmist could have been talking about today. To get us thinking about the broken being made whole, I I want to turn your attention to uh, an individual who is probably not likely to end up in many a sermon, but uh, someone who has had a tremendous amount of influence. And that, of course, is the late John Lennon. You don't know me very well yet, but my father loves everything about the Beatles. Uh, And of course, that means all of their music, including the stuff that Ringo puts out, which I guess is technically still music. As you might tell, I don't like Ringo that much. I'm sorry, Father, if you're listening. Uh, But John and Paul are pretty great, and George is okay, too. That's probably not good. That's, that'll probably be a conversation later for, between us. If you don't know, John Lennon has a song, uh, the title of which is up there, The Baby White Grand Piano, uh, maybe an image that some of you who are older might well pick up on, or those of you that are wor- versed in good music. Uh, but uh, the title of the song is Imagine. And uh, just, let me just read the lyrics to you for a moment. Um, Part of this comes about, I I heard a suggestion that this song replace even the national anthem, and I I got a a, a chuckle out of that. I'd actually already decided to use this particular illustration uh, prior to to learning that, but I I thought it was interesting and, and food for thought. But listen to the words, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try, no hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living For today, imagine there's no countries, isn't hard to do, nothing to kill or die for, no religion too. Imagine no possessions, I wonder if you can, no need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us in the world live as one. There's some certain things that I definitely disagree with in this song. 
But Lennon does make a point that Scripture actually affirms, and it's this. Number one, if you're following along in the bulletin, there is something wrong fundamentally with the way the world is. The whole point of the song is is Lennon trying to reimagine what life ought to look like. He makes some very clear missteps. We might address some of them. But he is absolutely correct in this particular notion. And I think that's why this song has, has resonated with so many people. As he recognizes that there is absolutely and fundamentally something broken about the world in which we live. Sixty years doesn't seem to have changed it a whole lot. You know, if you you look around the world in our present state, we see a world that is divided. Sometimes it's divided along racial lines. And I'm not just speaking in this country. This is a worldwide issue. Sometimes we divide ourselves by class, rich, poor, middle, upper middle, lower middle. Sometimes we divide ourselves by political party, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Green, could go on. We live in a world where violence rages. It can range from terrorism to those unnecessarily killed by those who are supposed to protect us, those who riot and devastate their own communities and do violence there. We live in a world today where nations do still continue to wage war against one another. In fact, in the past 100 years, the conservative estimate is that 187 million people died in violent conflicts as combatants, to say nothing of the devastation that was left for those who were civilians and those who were killed in, in, t- as terms of in genocidal death. Interesting, one of, the, one of the phrases that Lenin uses, people living for today, <laughs> he, th- he seems to think that's going to help be the answer, but the reality is, is we see people living just for today in the moment all the time. And that is not at all the answer. In fact, it is quite possibly a contributing factor to many of the ails that we do experience today. Another poet, Bob Dylan, put it like this, there are broken bottles and broken plates, broken switches and broken gates, broken dishes, broken parts, and streets are filled with broken hearts. Broken words never meant to be spoken, but everything is broken. You know, this is a broken world. Lenin, Lenin assumes, as do many other people, quite many people today, that one of the major problems in the world is people of faith. You can see a quote up there by, by Sam Harris, another person uh, who I'm quite confident is not going to end up in many sermons, uh, at least not certainly not uh, as, a, as a positive example. If you don't know who that is, you can come co- talk to me. I'm happy to fill you in. Uh, he, needless to say, he is not a Christian. Uh, And that is to put it quite mildly. But uh, many people will note and say, you know, the chief ail in the world is religion. And in particular, when people say that more often than not, uh, they have in mind Western Christianity. And so they'll say things like this. You know, religion has caused a lot of wars in history. In fact, if you you look down, you can find cases where religion is used for, for wars all throughout history. Then you have some that will come along and say, you know, religion caused slavery and was used to propagate, that is to continue its advancement. We could look at individuals like Richard Dawkins, an, an atheist who in his book, The God Delusion, said what we ought to do is we ought to outlaw religion outright and jail parents 
that teach their children to be religious in any way, shape, form, or fashion because it is child abuse. You have those who are still less militant than Dawkins, though I assume they would would share his desire uh, for the annexation of religion and and say, well, if you guys can just coexist, all our problems would kind of clean themselves up. These people are right in that the world is broken. They're wrong in terms to what the solution is. The reality is, is our world is offering up all kinds of solutions to the problems. And the reality is, is they're not getting to the heart of the matter. Uh, Last week, Richard had a fantastic class on getting us to think about not just the events, but what's behind the events. And, and there was the, the, the particular image that he used. He had, had one top, had the event that happened, and then he had the issues that are underneath those issues. And, and I think for us as Christians, we can understand that even underneath that layer, there's a core issue. And that is the brokenness of the human life because of sin. The problems of today are not going to be fixed by a government. They're not going to be fixed by money. No matter how much money in government you can throw at something, it's not going to fix the problems. Well, it might alleviate the symptoms for a while, but it's not addressing the core issue. The core issue of brokenness is the issue of sin and our separation from God and the evil that is in the human heart and our choices to continually be evil. And so what's the solution? The solution is... Well, to get us thinking about what the solution is, turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, a passage that uh, the Apostle Paul here illuminates for us where we can find unity and how we can find unity. But he also he uses a, a, a bit of language that we are quite unfamiliar with. And we're going to be looking at that language. That, that language, of course, is, is temple language, something that, that most of us are, are very unfamiliar with, the Jewish temple of Jesus's and Paul's day, if you prefer Herod's temple of the first century is its other name that can sometimes be used. Paul's going to use a lot of the language to talk about unity and disunity. We're going to examine that today, for I think it holds a lot of power for addressing the heart and sin issues that we face today. The Apostle Paul writes as follows, Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, or each other, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Paul knows how to paint a pretty bleak picture. But now... In Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace who has made both one, us both one, and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that He might create in Himself one new man in the place of the two. And so thereby making peace. And he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and preached peace to those who were near. For through him we have 
access in one spirit to the Father. And so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. And in him you are also being built together into an indwelling place for God by the Spirit. First off, as we look at this, number two, if you're following along in the bulletin, I want us to look at some of these, these descriptors that Paul says are items that cause separation or the way in which the Apostle Paul chooses to describe the separation that we experience. The first one up there, uncircumcision versus the circumcised. And we look at that and we go, well, that's weird. What do we do with that? Well, you're probably, or you, you might be aware, I, I don't know. This is, this is temple language, and this is identity language. If you want to put it in words today, this is race language that Paul is using here. On the one hand, you have the uncircumcised Greeks, and you have the circumcision, which are Jewish people. One of the things that that sometimes gets glossed over, we just forget about, is is a huge issue in the New Testament church is how do we get people who aren't anything alike, in fact, whom this group of people has disparaged for a long time, and this group of people doesn't care anything about this other, how do we get those two groups of people to be the church? How do we get Jews and Gentiles to be now The people of God. You can look over in Acts chapter 15 and you can see an entire church council is called to address this particular particular issue. You can look over in the book of Galatians and you can see the struggle that is there between law and Christ and the bringing together. How do we do this? There's a lot of questions. The Apostle Paul is, is pointing out there was a time... We were separated, divided at each other's throats. Give you an indication of how much the Jews loved the Gentiles. A frequent phrase that Jews would often give to Gentiles was, You Gentile dog. Not a compliment, I can assure you. We then have separated from Christ. So Paul spells it out in terms of separation. Just go ahead and use the word, right? There is a clear separation lost without life, without hope, without knowledge, without a Savior. If you are not in Christ Jesus, you are separated from Him. And ironically enough, you then become alienated. Sin will do that to you. Our next word there, alienated. In our sins, we are alone. We are in darkness, groping about without hope. We scrounge around looking for scraps and looking for answers and looking for community and looking for people, looking for a place to belong. And, we, and people will look anywhere and everywhere except where it can truly be found. Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, alone. Paul then uses the phrase, we are far off. Now, that is, again, temple language here. Uh, Typically, Jewish people would talk about those. The further and further and further you go away from the temple, which is in Jerusalem, which is the center of where all worship and life and spiritually happens for a Jewish person, you are far off or far away. You are distant. In other words, the further you were from the temple, the further you were from the presence of God. If we want to put it in a different way, the further you were from the temple, the further away spiritually you were seen to be from God. The temple is where it was all at. Interestingly enough, distance still separates people, most of which by our own doing from God. Paul uses one last phrase the dividing wall. 
Now, the dividing wall is something that uh, is, 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 you know, you look at that and you go, well, there's a wall that separates. Well, that's part of it. Let me tell you a little bit about what archaeology has discovered. You go to the, uh, the grounds in Jerusalem. There is a, there's an outer court of the temple. Everybody's welcome to, to the outer court. Okay? It's a big giant. There's a, there's a street, major thoroughfare that ran through it in Herod's temple in the first century. Beggars, unclean people, Gentiles. This is the outer court. It, it, it's really just kind of this, this opening space. People can begin the process of going into the temple. Even Gentiles could go into this place. But as you moved into the next section, the court of the women or the court of the Israelite women, there was this wall that had been erected. And on this wall there were plaques. And and, and let me just summarize what these plaques said to you. If you don't belong beyond these walls and we find you belong beyond them, we get to kill you. I want you to let that soak in for a moment. Think about our, our church context. Okay, How would it look to our community if we told our visitors, hey, we're really glad to have you as long as you stay in a parking lot. We're glad you're here, but stay out there. You can hear enough of what's going on out there. You'll be all right. Oh, by the way, if you come into the fellowship hall, we get to kill you. That's what's going on right here. You think these people took that segregation pretty serious? I, they did. You can look over in the book of Acts and you can see an instance where these people thought that Paul might have brought someone into the temple that he wasn't supposed to. There's a riot that, that ensues. Segregation, division, strife. These are things that have been part of the human experience for a long, long time. We like to think as human beings that we've evolved and gotten better, but, but we haven't. And so we need assistance. And so Christ talks to us through the Apostle Paul, and he talks about terms of nearness that we can have together. There's a lot of terms here actually. Brought near to God. So the opposite of that farness is being brought near. The idea of being brought near isn't just, well, you come close to me. This is the idea that I am now in the temple and I am at the altar able to sacrifice to my God, able to worship Him, in other words. The Apostle Paul tells us He is our peace in a world of violence, a world of hate, in a world of division. Don't we just long for some peace? Don't we look for it and pray for it and hope for it? There is no peace except for in Christ Jesus. The next one, we have this abolishing of the dividing wall of hostility. What once separated people from being able to go in and worship God, destroyed. Not just knocked down, completely done away with. I'm just a little too young to have clear memories of the ending of the Berlin Wall. I've seen pictures, I've watched some of those historical speeches, and I've seen people how they attack that wall with sledgehammers and the like. Do away with it completely. And in some sense, I think we we get a vision, a picture of what's being done here by the work of Christ. That wall crumbled to the ground and is done away with. I'm quite sure there were many East Germans and Soviet bloc people that that probably thought that wall is never coming down. But it did. I'm sure there, there were probably people in slavery who thought this is never going to go away. It can. 
I'm sure there were lots of people that thought, and you can fill in the blank there, with all of the things that God in Christ Jesus breaks down so that we can be, letter D, one new man, if you prefer, one new person. God specializes in restoring that which we as human beings have broken. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, Slave nor free, male or female, you are all one, where? In Christ Jesus. True unity is available only in and through the power of God. He preached peace. Again, the the concept of peace comes up. God creating peace in and of and through Himself. We are fellow citizens. What Paul, Paul's using all kinds of language here to get us to understand that no longer are the two separate, but are now joined together. Fellow citizens. No division. What once divided is now gone. It used to be said of the United States that it was the great melting pot. I don't know if you're familiar with that. The reality is... is The greatest melting pot of all is the body of Christ, the church, where God brings all people together. We're members of God's household. Now we're we're family. It's not just the walls broken down, not just citizens of the same nation or kingdom of God, members of the same household. You don't get to pick your family, do you? No. God picks His family. He picks you and me and all who are far off. The saying, blood is thicker than water, absolutely true in the case of Jesus Christ. A union that is bound stronger than any other. And finally, join together as a temple for God. The Apostle Paul talking about the hostility being broken, the the wall of hostility being broken down, uh, essentially saying the temple itself is going to become rubble. That wall's gone. But something new and better has replaced it. And it's the unity that you share with me and with each other. You ever built something with bricks? Let Let me raise my hand real quick and say, I have not. And you are grateful, okay? It's not anything I'm good at. There's something about bricks, or stones if you prefer. You build them, and they're next to each other, right? They're they're not a lot of good if you're like, well, I'm going to put a brick here, and, you know, I think I'll put a brick over here, and... I think, you know, that, that's probably going to make a pretty sturdy structure. You know, just some, just some bricks scattered around. It's not how it works, is it? Bricks got to be near each other. Supporting one another. Building together up one another. If you go home, if you have bricks or if you want... Bricks, what happens a lot of times, they get layered, Right? building a layer, they're close, they're compacted, they're held together by a foundation or steadied by a foundation. That's like what you and I are supposed to be with the children of God. God brings together and God keeps together. The Apostle Paul has spent a a fair bit of time talking about a reconciliation in this passage, talking about how Groups of people who are different can be reconciled. And he's assuming something in this passage. He's assuming he's talking to people who have already been reconciled to God. That's the first place you got to start. If we want to be truly reconciled in this country and in this nation and as people, we have to first be reconciled with God. And so this morning, if you are not, you need to know. Jesus Christ died for you and for the sins of the whole world. 
that you could become one in union with Him. Hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Repent of your sins. Confess that Jesus is Lord. Have those sins washed away in baptism and live faithfully to your God. And when you are reconciled with God, this then happens. You become one with God and each other. The way to unity for humanity, the answer to the root problem is to be unified with God through the grace that He offers through the blood of Jesus Christ. For us, the task of making division whole, or if you prefer, fixing the broken, is not one that is easy. Even even with Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith, even in our union with Him, there will still be struggles. Just look at the early church. They struggled with this issue. But there are some things we can do. Number one, pray, pray, and then pray some more. Too often... In our day and age, prayer is something we push off to the sidelines. It's not something to be picked up and go, oh yeah, I should probably pray a little bit. This needs to be who we are. People in constant prayer. The second thing I want to tell you is do not give in to the temptation of violence. Violence does not have a place in bringing wholeness. Violence begets more violence and brings anger. The solution to the problems is not going to be found at the edge of a sword. Rather, it will be found by overcoming evil with good. How can you do that? Be quick to listen. Be slow to speak. Let anger not have reign in your life. In difficulties with individuals that you don't agree with, remember they too were made in the image of God and are to be respected because of that. In trials, remember and resolve to be persecuted and ridiculed, taking a stand for what is good and right and holy. May God... Make peace in a broken world. He wants to. That's why Christ Jesus died. To bring reconciliation to a broken world. And the answer is plain. In Jesus Christ, you and I must be the lights and examples of that in our community today. That God may make the broken whole. This morning, if you're not a Christian, you are broken, but God wants to make you whole. The invitation is to come. If you're also a Christian and you're you're struggling with these issues and want prayer, support about something specific, then please come as well. The invitation is for you. Won't you come? As together we stand. As together we sing.